Well, good evening, everybody, and welcome to this evening's event from the Intellectual Forum here at Jesus College. Uh, my name is Julian Huppert. I'm the director of the Intellectual uh, Forum here, and it's great to have you here, whether you are here in Jesus College in person, in this wonderful Frankopan Hall, or whether you are watching us online. We've had people from well over 100 countries join us for events, so we're hoping to boost that to slightly more than 100, but it's very good to have you there. Now, some of you will know Jesus very well, uh, the college, not the deity, um, but some of you, this may be your first time here in person or remotely. We originally founded in 1144, when a small group of itinerant nuns were given a little plot of land just outside Cambridge. King Malcolm IV of Scotland expanded it in 1146. In 1496, the new Bishop of Ely decided to kick all the women out and turn it into an all-male college, something we have since fixed. We have had amazing people here who have shaped thinking around the world, who have made the world a much different place. Uh, Thomas Cranmer, the Archbishop, who was involved with changing the religion here. Uh, Thomas Malthus, who wrote a lot about population, how we should think about that. More recently, wonderful people like Lisa Jardine, and for some of you will know Clean Bandit. Rock you know, yeah, a few people are smiling, uh, so they formed here. And there's many, many other people in the college who have made a huge difference. The Intellectual Forum was set up in 2016 to try to get people to think and talk about interesting and important things, and also to reach outside the boundaries of our own college, uh, to the public in Cambridge and around the world. And so we've run many events, and it's a huge pleasure to have a real star for tonight's event. Now, I normally don't talk about my own background, but I got to know this character because I used to be the Member of Parliament here in Cambridge. And so, obviously, Mr. Speaker was a hugely important person, not least because he got to decide whether I was allowed to say anything or not. Uh, this time I get to ask the question and control it a bit more, so there's a slight change. But it's really wonderful to have uh, John Burko here. Um, we'll have a conversation for a while, maybe 20, 25 minutes, then there'll be a chance for all of you to ask questions, and if you're online, use the Q&A feature. Um, so I'm not going to give you a full bio because we're going to pick some of it up as we go. Uh, but most of you know the basics. He became an MP in 1997 and was Speaker from 2009 until 2019, being dragged to the chair, elected in 2009, re-elected 2010, 15, 17, and then eventually decided he'd had enough. But he had to cope with the coalition, had to cope with Brexit, with a huge set of changes. It's a great pleasure to have him with us. John, thank you for being with us tonight. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So thank you for, for this evening. It's been great to have you here, here at Jesus. My pleasure. Um, before we talk about politics, can we just talk about the you before 97? You, you grew up in a family. Was it expected that you'd go into politics? Did people think that was the route for you? What, what inspired you or drove you? Well, I think, first of all, a big thank you to you for having me here. I blame the London Underground, a magnificent system, for the fact that we met on the occasion we did on a tube train when I was, perhaps appropriately in the circumstances, coming away from doing some research at the British Library much earlier this year, and I chanced upon Julian on the tube train and we had a conversation and that was the background to or the genesis of this visit. So thank you. I've already spent a bit of time with Julian today and I don't want it to be a mutual admiration society and I doubt there's much danger of that. But I would like to say at the outset that we did get to know each other in the House and Julian as a member of Parliament, always in my experience as chair in the chamber, added value when he got to his feet. I didn't see his working committee, though I would imagine it was of the highest caliber, but certainly in the chamber, I did hear him. I had an outstanding vantage point to hear people, as you will know, and I want to use that expression advisedly. He added value. He didn't speak for the sake of speaking. He spoke because he had something to say, something to contribute that was often different from or an extension of or an improvement on uh, what had already been said. So from my point of view, it's an absolute delight, Julian, to see you again. Was it expected that I would go into politics? Well, I think the short answer to that is that by my family, it had come to be expected because 
Candidly, over a period of 18 years, I had wanted one day to get into the house and did, 18 years after conceptualising the idea in the first place. So if you are of that milieu or that genre that thinks in terms of the career politician and does so with some disapproval, well, then I must own up to the fact that I fall into that category. I was somebody, to be candid, who always wanted one day to be a politician. I did do some other things first, but from the age of 16, just 16, I wanted one day to be a politician. There was a, a negative and a positive. The negative was that I disapproved of the then Callaghan government. In retrospect, I've got a rather higher opinion of Jim Callaghan now than I had then. Uh, he has been dead for the best part of two decades and I think would have been supremely untroubled by my view of him either way. But in retrospect, I've got a higher opinion of him than I had at the time. But I thought the Labour government was bad and I thought in particular the trade union movement was holding the country to ransom. My teachers were roughly equally divided between supporters of the Callaghan government and Benite critics of it. None of them was a Conservative. And so I think in a way becoming a Conservative was partly rebellion against my teachers and partly that I sucked from my father's cup. My father was a small business person and very pro-Conservative. My mother had absolutely no interest in politics at all. She was always interested in the arts, literature and theatre and cinema and ballet and so on. And I remember my mother saying to me, personally, dear, I think politics is an absolutely ghastly business. I haven't the stomach for it. And I would that you would prefer to opt for another career, but I hope I'm a good mum. And if that's your chosen course, then I'll support you every step of the way, which she always did. And she's still around now, though not now well. But my father has been dead a very long time. Dad, I think, did sense that I wanted to go into the house. And when he passed away, I came across a little sort of scrapbook of cuttings and that was in 1986 that he passed away and on the front I see he had scribbled John en route to the commons so he obviously <laughs> thought I was going to get into the house it wouldn't more widely on a more serious level have been expected I suppose Julian and I I guess I might sound slightly chippy in saying this and I don't mean to sound chippy I'm just being honest it wouldn't more widely have been expected because although there are always been exceptions over the generations. The Tory party has always had some outsiders who've had a, a bit of luck or a patron or a well-wisher and despite being from an atypical background have managed to get into the house. Those were the exceptions, not the rule. The most notable exception, I suppose, being Disraeli, being Jewish of origin and ending up in a substantially anti-Semitic party at the time, becoming Prime Minister, but of course he wasn't a practising Jew, he disavowed it and you know he made alliances where it was necessary to advance the career of B. Disraeli. I don't think it would generally have been expected that I would get into the House because, you know, I was state school, no private money, not remotely aristocratic, no particular connections at all, and I recall this more with wry amusement than anything else now but it is a fact that when I got into the house in 1997 I fairly quickly came up I was going to say came across I think came up against would be more accurate a characterization a Tory MP who was not sort of how can I put it over endowed up here <laughs> he wasn't in danger of being a huppet. Uh, he wasn't an intellectual. He might have known the meaning of the word forum, but he had, I doubt he would have known the meaning of the word intellectual. But he was a very aristocratic Tory. And he said to me very early on, uh, Burkhoff, he always insisted on calling me Burkhoff, uh, which was obviously uh, sort of mildly insulting, but no more than that. If I had my way, people like you wouldn't be in this place. And I said to him in reply, when you say people like me, do you mean because I'm lower class or because I'm Jewish? To which, without a moment's hesitation, he replied, both. 
<laughs> so from his point of view, I was obviously a most unwelcome entrant into the house. But, you know, I suppose I was stubborn and I wanted to get into the house. At the time, I was conservative. And, you know, the rest is history. I have made quite a journey over the years and I admit that it's an untypical journey. There are a lot of people... I don't know whether this is statistically evidenced, but there's at least an anecdotal sense that people often become more conservative as they get older. That may or may not be true, but in my case, it's most definitely not true. I have come across quite a lot of people who've become more conservative as they've got older. As I've got older, I've moved leftwards, and you may approve of my journey, or you may disapprove of my journey, or you might not give a flying flamingo about my journey, but my journey has been an honest journey. There was no contrivance, there was no artifice about it. Uh, at one point, a particularly dim-witted journalist on the Mail, I think, sort of said that I'd moved leftwards in order to get elected as Speaker. Uh, I mean, this really was uh, a sort of story you'd tell to the Marines. Complete and utter <laughs> nonsense. You know, the views I have held over the years have been honest views. And for many years now, frankly, I must tell you candidly, for many years now I've regarded myself as a person to the left of centre. And, you know, I could explain that if it's of interest to you and not if it isn't. But the Conservative tradition is an honourable tradition in the United Kingdom, though I think the Conservative Party now, I don't just mean in terms of political peril, but in terms of sort of moral status and intellectual conviction, is in the worst state of my lifetime. I've never known the Conservative Party in a worse state. I must admit I wouldn't now vote Conservative anyway. I'm a Labour supporter. But when I think of some of the great Conservatives, some of whom are still alive, and most of whom are sitting in the House of Lords, people like Ken Clark and Michael Heseltine and Chris Patton, uh, Douglas Hurd, you know, I would have thought today's Conservative Party is scarcely recognisable to people of that very high calibre. Um. So you, you, you had, had your career, and as you say, I was going to ask about the journey, but you, you've largely addressed that. Sure. Can, we, can we talk about the experience of being a speaker? Because that's sort of what you're most famous for, um, you know, the catchphrase of, you know, order, order, and all the rest of it. Um, uh, you know, you, I think you're saying somebody calculated quite how many times you said the word order. 14,000 times <laughs> so. over 10 years. Yeah. So it's great that you can search Hansard these days and do it electronically, but... Uh, <laughs> But what, what's it like being there presiding in such a high-stakes moment that all the cameras are there, people are watching you all the time, you have to make lots of really quick decisions, which you presumably can't always get right? No. How did you find that experience? Did it get easier? Did it get harder? I think, on the whole, it gets easier with practice, Julian. And I don't think, because of the constraint of time, that one really has the luxury of feeling gravely anxious about it. And we all have flaws, because Dewar is human, and of course I've got my flaws, and what are they? Well, that's for me to know and for you to find out, uh, but there's a plentiful supply of them. But I didn't sit around feeling anxious. You know, people sometimes have said to me, but that position, literally that physical centrality of the chair in the chamber and the sense of the history of the institution, as well as the salience and immediacy of the important issues which Parliament is treating of at the time, surely must have conduced to a feeling of concern, a sort of frisson of anxiety in you. And the, the honest answer is no. I did feel on big set-piece occasions some butterflies. I did feel mild nervousness. And I think if you don't feel that, then you're probably complacent and will underperform. So I did feel that to an extent, you know, like on the state opening of Parliament, I felt nervous, both nervous and almost unspeakably upset on the occasion that we met immediately after the murder of Joe Cox. And I knew that I was going to go into the chamber and lead the tributes to her in a situation that was, I think, at that point, without precedent. You can't say many things in Parliament are without precedent because of a precedent for most things. But there hadn't been for that. And I knew Jo. I wouldn't say we were close friends, but I knew her and was on friendly terms with her. And I was very shaken by the whole thing. And so I felt nervous that day because I wanted my words to 
be weighted properly and I wanted to say what was in my head and my heart and I did feel quite nervous. But I think at those key Brexit moments, Julian, the pressure is on just to make a decision there and then and you simply don't have the luxury so self-indulgently to internalise it and think, oh, isn't it all very difficult? And wow, this is me and I've got to make a decision. You really do just get on with it. And I don't know, I suppose uh, maybe it's at the root of some of the, the difficulties I've had over the years. Uh, there's an element of sort of insubordination <laughs> in me. And, you know, people sometimes say, well, didn't you feel nervous about clashing with the Prime Minister, for example? And the honest answer is I didn't. I didn't feel nervous about that. I felt slightly nervous about meeting Her Majesty the Queen. And Her Majesty the Queen was magnificent at putting one at ease. She put me at ease, as she did, I think, everybody she met. She had a great gift for that, and a lot of experience, of course, of doing it. But was I nervous about clashing with David Cameron or with Boris Johnson, to be honest, I wasn't. And, and maybe, you know, if people were to look back, maybe people would see a particular exchange and think that it was irreverent of me to deploy the tone that I did. Maybe. But I feel that you're dealing with imperfections in these situations. And I was dealing with prime ministers, and I don't wish to be abusive about David, uh, I, I could probably be quite tempted to be abusive about Alexander Morris, <laughs> but I don't want to be abusive about David. But I, mean, I wouldn't say we were united in fraternal detestation <laughs> of each other's guts. I think that would probably be an overstatement. But we weren't exactly joined at the hip, to put it mildly. You know, and on one occasion, somebody said to me afterwards, "Well, you were quite brusque with Prime Minister Cameron," and I suppose I was. But he, I knew ladies and gentlemen, that he was taking liberties. He'd been asked a question and he'd given a fairly comprehensive non-answer. And then he said and that he wanted to turn to the recent book by Deborah Mattinson, who's a pollster, an advisor to Labour, about the Labour Party's failed election campaign. So he was, if you like, in parliamentary terms, almost leading with his chin, waiting to be punched by the Speaker, <laughs> because he was totally out of order. It was nothing to do with what he'd been asked. So I interrupted and said, oh, order, order, order. Uh, we're not getting into that, because it was irrelevant. And, the, and Cameron said to me, but Mr Speaker, I haven't finished. And it was just instinctive. It was just instinctive. I said to him, let, let me just say to the Prime Minister, in response to that question, he has finished. And he can take it from me that he's finished. And afterwards, I was told that he regarded it as very rude. Well, you know, he'll have to develop a thicker skin. I thought, you know, stuff it was like at the end, once when we overran. He said to me, we overran by a very modest five minutes, again, because of long answers that he'd given. And I wanted to include as many questions as possible. And at the end, he came up to me as he left the chamber and he, he said rather irritatedly, Mr. Speaker, I would just remind you, I have got a plane to catch. And I said, yes, I understand that, Prime Minister, but it is your plane. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. anyway, anyway. So, the, there's a, we were talking earlier about sort of constitutional principles in this country, and one of them is the, the famous Dicey comment yes. that Parliament can make or unmake any law, that Parliament is sovereign, everything's up to Parliament. In truth, it's normally up to the government, and Parliament yes. does what government wants. How did you see that balance, and to what extent do you think it's possible for Parliament to take charge from government? Uh, Julian, you've got it in one. The theory is parliamentary control, but the practice is that in a situation in which, in a political culture in which government sits in parliament and there's no separation of powers as in the United States there is, effectively parliamentary decision making means most of the time government decision making. Now there are two things that have challenged that over the last 13 years. First, in the 2010 Parliament, there came into being, as a result of a parliamentary vote, 
what came to be known, ladies and gentlemen, as BBCOM, the Backbench Business Committee. And the Backbench Business Committee resulted from consideration before the 2010 election by the Right Committee, a cross-party committee, of possible changes to Parliament that would strengthen the legislature. And Tony Wright, Dr Tony Wright, who was the chair of the committee, was a Labour member in the West Midlands, Cannock Chase, but it was a cross-party committee and it came up with a menu for reform of the House that was basically designed to help the legislature. And it included, very sensibly in my view, the recommendation which was adopted that we elect chairs of select committees. So instead of government whips basically deciding who will chair committees, the decisions were made by the House, by a secret ballot, which seems to me an altogether more mature, a responsible and, and self-respecting way of Parliament doing business. And there were various other recommendations with which I won't bore you, but probably the most important was there should be a backbench business committee which should be allowed to control the business 35 days a year, 35 sitting days a year. What does that mean? Ladies and gentlemen, most of the time, to go back to Julian's question, the government controls the business of the House most days. If there's an opposition day, the opposition choose the motion and the vote. They can't choose whether they win the vote, but they choose what the motion and therefore the vote will be. And there are private members' bills days, which are on Fridays, and a small number of exceptions. But otherwise, the general working principle of Parliament is that the government understanding Order 14 controls the agenda. And what the right committee suggested and the House agreed just before the 2010 election was there should be a backbench business committee that could choose debates 35 days a year and have votes on them. They wouldn't be binding on government but government might want to take note of them and give effect to some of those decisions. And that is what happened after the 2010 election. But not everything is written down. And on one occasion, there was a backbench business debate on a motion that government compensation for victims of contaminated blood should be greatly increased. Yeah, that the compensation was inadequate and should be increased. And I tell this story not against him personally, he's rather a good, <laughs> a decent man, but there was a deputy chief whip at the time in the coalition government called Alistair Carmichael, who will be well known to Julian as a Liberal Democrat member from Orkney and Shetland, uh, with a wonderful Scottish burr of an accent. And the government had tabled what we call a wrecking amendment to try to screw this motion. And... Amendments are called before main motion, so it was designed to kick out of touch, yeah? Almost as though one was playing a kind of hockey, if you like, or croquet. And I decided that it, it, it wasn't disorderly, but it was highly questionable whether it should be selected, and I decided not to select the government amendment. And Alastair, in his very polite way, stood up to ask me a question, which was effectively an attack, but it was very polite. He said, Mr Speaker, I wonder if you can provide guidance. He said, I struggle to find any example of a government amendment that has not been selected for debate and vote. And I said to Alastair, I think he's on the record in Hansard, the right honourable gentleman's point is both true and irrelevant. It's true that there is no such precedent, and it's irrelevant, because we're in uncharted territory. This is new business, it's backbench business. I'm not under any obligation to select a government amendment. That amendment is about wrecking the motion. It's not an amendment, it's about wrecking it, and I'm not selecting it. End of. End of subject. So the government took quite a while to get used to that, though eventually they did. The second development was at the time of Brexit. And the reason that was significant was different to... Backbench Business Committee. Backbench Business Committee came in when there was a government majority, I think, of 77 between the Conservatives and the Liberals. From 2017, the government didn't have a majority. And many of the troubles that you all witnessed on your television screens, and some of you may have agreed with some of my decisions and others of you may not have done, arose from the fact that you had a government determined to deliver Brexit and a House that didn't agree to any particular proposition. And eventually, I was in a situation where I had to make decisions about what votes to allow. And I, I promise not to bore you with the, the 
interstices of the system or the detail of this, but there were a number of incidents that arose. Uh, on one occasion, Dominic Grieve tabled an amendment to a government business motion, and I granted his amendment. Now, apparently the clerks had advised the government that it wouldn't be selected. Well, they didn't ask me. No, they didn't ask me. And it was for me to decide. And I selected Dominic Greaves' amendment, which was then passed by the House. And the government chief whip complained bitterly to me at the time that it was improper. And he said he'd been told it was unamendable. And I said, well, it's not unamendable, Julian. That's not the case. And, it, and I was challenged about, well, when exactly have such amendments been selected and so on. Ladies and gentlemen, we were in uncharted territory, minority government, no clear sense of what the House wanted, and I decided that Dominic's amendment should be tested. And it was, and it passed. And then the other big occasion when there was a real bust-up was when, I mean, there was a bust-up over the prorogation of Parliament, which I thought was an absolute scandal on the part of the Johnson government. And, and of course, they lost. And that's the fact of the matter. They lost in court. When Gina Miller and others took them to court, they lost. But there was a, an issue towards the end when, I think this is a very important issue of where power lies and what is proper. The government under Theresa May and under Boris Johnson, whatever the differences between those two, was taking the attitude, the House must go with my Brexit deal or we'll crash out with none. That's the situation. Now... <laughs> There were very large numbers of members of Parliament, the whole of the opposition pretty much, even some of the Unionists, and a significant minority of Conservative MPs who thought that was unacceptable. And they approached me and said they, they thought that a no-deal Brexit would be calamitous for the country. And they wanted to ask my permission to table a change to the standing orders so that government couldn't block them and they could put a proposition that Standing Order 14 be suspended and if they were successful they could then table a piece of legislation to stop a no-deal Brexit on the 31st of October 2019 unless the House had explicitly voted for such a no-deal Brexit. And I agreed to that, I looked at the Standing Orders and subsequently Alexander Boris de Feffel phoned me up about it. Now, I don't want to be too unkind. I don't want to be too unkind to Boris, but that does give me a little bit of latitude, a little bit of scope. Because what did the right honourable gentleman, the member for Uxbridge and South Ryslip, have to say to me? Well, first of all, I invite you to stretch your vivid imaginations. Do you think the right honourable gentleman was deeply versed in parliamentary procedure? <laughs> Do you think he had a close understanding uh, of the words in front of him? Or, let alone a comprehensive grasp of the standing orders of the House. Well, if you do, I, I simply say to you, uh, that's a triumph of Panglossian optimism on your part. <laughs> uh, no, it was obvious he didn't have any uh, serious grasp of these important matters. But what he said to me was, was as follows. He said, can I, can I, can I, can I, can I say, Mr Speaker, uh, I, I, sir, I'm bound to say uh, that uh, uh, I think in general terms, as, 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 as you know, uh, I, I'm, a, I'm a considerable fan of yours. Uh, I'm a considerable <laughs> fan of yours. Uh, but, 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 I, uh, but I'm bound to say this, this decision you made to allow this bill and the, the Ben Act, named after Hillary Ben, that has flowed from it, this, this Ben Act has, has been extremely, extremely, extremely unhelpful uh, to, 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 to our negotiating uh, position. Uh, and Connor... Connor Burns, who was his PPS at the time, his parliamentary private secretary. Connor tells me you should never have allowed it. Uh, you should never have allowed it because the 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 the, 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 the legal position the legal position is that um, the, the the government controls uh, the business. Uh, so I said, Tim, Prime Minister, I, I don't wish to be discourteous to you, but uh, I said with with very great respect, we're not talking about a legal position here. I think what Connor probably rather fumblingly, has in mind, is the standing orders of the House. The standing orders of the House, Prime Minister, are not a matter of law. The standing orders of the House are the property of the House. The House can do what it likes with its standing orders. The House has exclusive cognizance, yes, of its own procedures. And if the House wants to suspend its standing orders, it can. If it wants to rip them up and replace them on a particular day, it can. If it wants to amend them, it can. If it wants to suspend them, it can. It can do what it likes. And he said, yes, but you let this bill go through. And I said, no, I let the vote happen.
So my thinking is the role of the speaker, and if you think I got it all wrong, you're absolutely entitled to that view and there's no hard feelings between us. Nobody can please or satisfy everybody. I took the view, Julian, that the role of the speaker was not to pay a bicence to, uh, still less be a, a kind of uh, lapdog of the government of the day. The role of the speaker is to let the House have its say and have its way. And I said to Boris Johnson at the time, he's obviously very irritated with me, I said, Prime Minister, I, I'm sorry if you're disappointed about it. It is not my responsibility as Speaker to protect you from the absence of a government majority. If you haven't got a majority, that is your problem. But, you know, were they going to browbeat me into doing their bidding, I don't know what century he had in mind. I mean, you know, I would rather, I literally would rather, and my family knew this, I'd rather have been forced out of the chair uh, than ingratiate myself with these people and do what I was told. But I had a sense that there were quite a lot of people in the house who just thought, quiet life, quiet life, just don't make an argument out of it, just do what you're t told, you know, let the Prime Minister have his way. Although that's not my way, sorry. So we've talked about the government versus parliament. Parliament and parliamentarians haven't always covered themselves in glory. No. Um, for anybody who hasn't been in the Commons when PMQs is happening, the volume is phenomenal. The shouting, the you know, astonishingly poor behaviour. You know, it's genuinely hard to hear what's being said. Um, we have some pretty shocking behaviour by people. There's you know, sexual harassment, there's some rape cases... Uh, you know, huge amounts of bullying throughout, racial discrimination. It's a pretty shocking story. Yeah. Um, can it be fixed? Should you have done more to fix it? W who does have the responsibility to sh make sure that, you know, parliamentarians are actually something the country can be proud of? Yeah. I probably should have done more as far as the chamber was concerned. I mean, there's a long list of things that I did change in the chamber in terms of procedures to try to strengthen the house. Hell of a lot of things I did outside the chamber to do with making it more child friendly, uh, establishing an education centre, improving diversity of staff representation amongst minorities, communities and so on and so forth. I did a hell of a lot of things to build links with universities and, you know, I was constantly on a reforming mission. But as far as behaviour at Prime Minister's questions was concerned, my feeling was that change would happen, Julian, only if the major party leaders wanted it to happen. And, you know, I did now and again make speeches about it, about how we could have a, a yellow card and a red card system and so on and so forth. The truth is that when party leaders are new, they tend to make little speeches about improving conduct and wanting a more respectful atmosphere. And that goes very quickly. David Cameron talked about it, and then no sooner was he in office than he wanted what the Chief Whip described to me as a wall of noise behind him. He wanted there to be a wall of noise. And Ed Miliband, when he became Labour leader, was interested in developing a, a more respectful approach, but his whips didn't want it. They, they wanted a lot of noise behind him and so on. So... You know, should I have thrown more people out? I threw out three people over the years. Funnily enough, they were all opposition members, but none of them was thrown out for shouting. They were all thrown out for accusations of dishonesty, <laughs> uh, which itself has become controversial. It wasn't really very controversial then because there was some basic standard. And when somebody <coughs> accused somebody else of dishonesty, it was generally frowned upon. So Paul Flynn, who's sadly no longer with us, but who was a very, very dedicated and good Labour backbencher in Newport, was looking to be thrown out when he had a go at Philip Hammond. And I entreated Paul, who was a friend, I mean, I got on very well with him, to withdraw, and he wouldn't withdraw. And I retreated not one inch and said to him again, you must withdraw, and he wouldn't. And I had to ask him to leave the chamber. Dennis Skinner uh, attacked Cameron's <laughs> lack of honesty, and Dennis was looking to be thrown out. Believe me, I know these things. <laughs> and I remember Dennis at the time, who again was pretty friendly, but I remember Dennis sort of saying to me, I repeat, my, I stand by my point. I call him Dodgy Dave. And then he looked at me, <laughs> Dennis, with his usually irreverent 
style. And Dennis Skinner waved his arm at me and said, do what you like. <laughs> and, you know, and I, I asked him to leave the chamber. And then Nigel Dodds, Nigel Dodds, the Ulster Unionist, Democratic Unionist leader, accused Theresa May of deception which is an imputation of dishonesty. It may seem rather mild, but we're supposed to be honourable and right honourable members. And I asked him to withdraw, and he wouldn't. And he left the chamber. The interesting thing about Nigel is that one of my staff subsequently saw him very soon afterwards, a matter of minutes later, met in the central lobby by a member of his staff with a packed suitcase. <laughs> so I think Nigel had decided he wanted to go back to Northern Ireland and issue a press release and say he'd, he'd had a go at the Northern Ireland Secretary. So, you know, sometimes people just want to be thrown out. Should I have thrown out other people? Possibly over the years, and my successor has done a couple of times. There have been a couple of MPs who've behaved very badly and he's told them to leave. Uh, as to the other issues, I mean, Carl Turner was the noisiest member of the House. He's still there. I, I've made Carl Turner almost famous around the world by mentioning him. He's the, the member for Kingston upon Hull East. Carl Turner's particular shtick, ladies and gentlemen, I don't know if you're not aware of this honourable gentleman, but you're going to be when I've finished. Uh, his particular shtick was to yell every day at the government benches. He's a, a Labour member in Hull. He would yell, shocking! It's a disgrace! And then he would point at some minister on the front bench <laughs> like this and say, behave, with no H, behave, whilst conspicuously failing to do so himself. And I did used to say to, to Kelsey, oh, I would either call him the member for Kingston Hall East or else I would sometimes address him by his name and say, order Mr. Turner, calm yourself. You're a very overexcitable denizen of the house. You need to calm down, and if you can't calm down, you need to go and lie down in a dark room and take a soothing medicament that you will find therapeutic. And he would tend to come up to me afterwards and say, oh, Mr. Spee, he was very gracious and very good-natured. He just went from naught to 60 in about five seconds. He would come up and say, oh, Mr. Speaker, well, I do apologise. <laughs> oh, I was absolutely infuriated by what the minister said, which would be very damaging to my constituents in Hull. But as soon as I exploded, I knew I was in for a bollocking. <laughs> <laughs> Should I have done more on the other issues? Well, the answer is those were decisions for the House to take. They were decisions for the House to take. Did I, I mean, did I know, for example, about the occasion when Eric Joyce, who was a, a Labour member with some troubles in his life, who committed acts of violence, committed those acts of violence? Did I know about it? Well, of course I did. It was reported to me, and I banned him from the use of the bar for a period of months and so on and so forth, and I think he had some help. But of course I knew about those cases and tried to act decisively. With um, cases of harassment, the truth is that the Speaker would not tend to know about it. And I remember on one occasion when somebody, a, a well-intentioned Conservative member, a female Conservative member, came to see me to complain actually about one of the Deputy Speakers. And she was looking for me to deal with the matter. And she described what she said she'd been told. She hadn't witnessed firsthand. And she wanted me to deal with it. And I said, well, I can speak to the, the, the person concerned, but I can't be sure whether he will agree to it. My, my strong advice is that the person who's got the, the gripe, and maybe a very real gripe, must go to the police. And she wasn't very happy with that, but that was my advice. And I did speak to the, the deputy speaker at the time, who, who said his recollection of matters was very different. But she was, in a sense, saying, you need to sack the deputy speaker. And I said, I can't do that. He's an elected deputy speaker. And she said, well, he didn't really want, the person concerned didn't really want to go to the police. And I said, well, I'm sorry, but somebody needs to report it to the police. Now, in the end, the matter did get reported to the police. And Nigel Evans, it's a matter of historical record, was charged with sex offences. And it did go to court, and he was acquitted. Now, could I have acted differently? I might have done. I think if I'd acted differently, I could legitimately have been accused of overreaching myself. There is a principle of innocent until proven guilty. And I simply said to her, get it reported to the police. I, I think it is right. I think it's right that the House has developed anti-bullying and harassment policies. I have no complaint about that. Uh, I think it's the right thing to do. And it will probably, over a period, improve the culture. Uh, you know, I don't think it's right to use 
this occasion when I'm answering questions about all sorts of things that you might want to ask, I don't want to, to hog the issue. It is no secret that I myself was accused of bullying staff and the House amended its procedures to incorporate an historic complaints procedure and four cases were brought against me, one of which I won and it was, it was thrown out and the other three were resolved against me to my great disappointment and chagrin. Uh, all I can say is that I accept that the House had a right to make those decisions. I accept that. There was a, a procedure established. But I don't have to accept that the decision was right. And I don't. And, you know, at one point I was asked by the chairman of the so-called independent expert panel, you know, whether I wish to issue a letter of reflection. And it became apparent in the course of exchanges that what he really meant was a letter of apology. And I said, no, I, I don't intend to do so, not because I'm too big to apologise, not because I think I've never made mistakes, but because I'm not going to apologise for that which I don't believe I did. And uh, he obviously wasn't impressed by that, and he's welcome to that view, but I'm entitled to mine. And the only thing I would say to you, ladies and gentlemen, is that we were t dealing with civil matters. They weren't criminal matters. They were civil matters. And any of you who knows anything of the law will know that in civil matters there are statutes of limitations. Matters are not normally treated of in a court of law many, many years after they are alleged to have happened. And, you know, I was accused of blanking somebody on an aircraft, causing her great upset to be ignored by me on an aircraft to Africa in September 2010. The complaint was brought in May 2020, nearly 10 years later. And of course, what was my answer? You know, I remember the flight to Africa, I remember the day, I remember the date. I didn't blank that person. It was a night flight as I was en route to Nairobi to speak at a conference. I didn't blank her. I was asleep. You know, I was accused of staring at this person in a hostile way. And I said to the investigator, I'm a bit surprised in your draft report, Mr. W, that you've not sought evidence, the testimony of the nine other living persons who were present at the meeting. And he said, well, he didn't intend to do that. And I said, well, why is that? And this was in writing. And he said to me, well, there are two reasons why I don't intend to invite the witnesses for their testimony. The first, Mr. Burko, is that is, as it's such a long time ago, they wouldn't remember. <laughs> so, I, so I said, well, they certainly wouldn't remember that which didn't happen. But forgive me, the burden of your thesis and indeed of the complainant's complaint is that it did happen. And according to her, I didn't just stare at her, I stared at her in a hostile way for a protracted period of time with a hate-filled expression on my face. I said to him, are you familiar with the, the layout of Speaker's House? And he said, no, he wasn't. I said, do you know about the House of Commons Commission? And he said, no, he didn't. And I said, well, I was chairing the meeting. I can tell you exactly who was at the meeting. We sat round a table. I was in the central chair. I said, forgive me, Mr. W. Um, <laughs> If I had behaved in the way alleged, I rather think that one of the attendees would remember something. Why didn't you ask them? And he said, no. He said, I'm running this investigation, not you. And I said, no, fair enough. But my point, I think, stands. That's the first point. The second point, he was even more intriguing. He said to me, no, no, Mr. Burke, I don't intend to ask the witnesses because at the point at which you were allegedly staring, and I believe you did, in a hostile way, the clerk was addressing the meeting. And therefore, it logically follows that the natural focus of attention of your colleagues on the commission will have been on the clerk, not on you. And I said, well, the seating plan at these meetings was always the same, and I think, and the minutes will show how long he spoke, which was very briefly. But I said, the seating plan was always the same. I sat in this seat, the clerk sat in that seat, etc. And he said, yes, he accepted that. And I said, are you aware of the clerk? Do you know the clerk concerning? He said, no, he didn't know him. And I said, well, Dr. Jack was a very cerebral and distinguished figure in the house and a very good clerk for that matter. He didn't want to give evidence. He's retired. And anyway, he didn't give evidence. But I said, Dr. Jack was a very serious and cerebral figure. Uh, but I said, he was by way of being quite a diffident ex-British public schoolboy. And he had quite a, if I may say so, understated delivery. He spoke extremely briefly on that occasion, as I think the minutes will testify, which they did. And I said, forgive me, Mr. W, I don't know how many meetings you've attended in your life. The idea that 
that people are incapable of noting two things at once. And the idea that people were so transfixed by the mesmerising power of Dr Jack's oratory that they didn't notice that I was staring hate-filled at this member of staff is so incongruous as not to be worthy of any further discussion. But anyway, he found against me. Now, you know, he's entitled to found against me. I'm entitled to think that the whole thing uh, was a shambolic, amateurish stitch-up and to call it a kangaroo court is unfair to kangaroos. And one of these days, I'll tell you what I really think. <laughs> so I just want to do a couple of sort of quick fire type questions, and then we will get on to questions. So do start thinking of them. And if you're online, do put them on the Q&A feature there. So just a few really quick ones. Yep. You had the chance to see hundreds of politicians performing. Who really stood out? Oh, different people in different ways. Ladies and gentlemen, in the chamber, not a speaker, because he, I didn't witness him from the chair as speaker, he'd retired by then. For me, the best speaker with a small s in the chamber of the House of Commons in my 22 years uh, was Tony Benn. The late Tony Benn was the best, in my opinion. Not intellectually, and not as a debater. Tony was not actually a great debater. He tended to take the attitude he wanted to develop the argument, as he put it. And sometimes people would try to interrupt Tony and say, well, Mr Deputy Speaker, if the Honourable Gentleman doesn't mind, I'd like to develop the argument. He might be successful in catching your eye later in the proceedings. But if, if you'll forgive me, I'll be pressing on with my next point. So he wasn't a natural debater, really. He mainly just wanted to say what he wanted to say. Tony did have... I gently referred, I hope not unkindly, to Malcolm Jack, who was a really good man, but Malcolm's a clerk of the house, he wasn't an orator. Tony did have a mesmerising talent as an orator. He captivated the house, and he had the house in his thrall. So I would say he was the best public speaker in the chamber. Others who were very good, very good, were Ken Clark, uh, Malcolm Rifkind, and George Galloway, to be fair... George Galloway is wrong-headed, in my view, about lots of things, and he's what I call a one-club golfer. He has no great variation in pace or tone. It's mainly a sustained, uninterrupted rant, <laughs> uh, but it is very eloquent. But personally, in my opinion, the best debater I heard in my time in the House uh, was the late Robin Cook. <laughs> I think Robin was uh, the sharpest he wasn't, I'm not sure Robin was really an orator, though he was a very good speaker. He, I don't think he was a platform orator. He didn't, have the, he didn't have what I call the Michael Heseltine gift of being able to wow an audience. I did serve in the House with Michael, but Michael was pretty quiet in the last Parliament. I didn't hear much from him. So I, and was he a good debater? He was a good debater. But I would say best speaker, Ben. Best debater, Robin Cook. Robin was formidably sharp. He was not universally popular, partly on account of the fact that he found no need to conceal his knowledge of the fact that he was, by a country mile, the cleverest person in the chamber, <laughs> which didn't greatly endear him to colleagues, but he was a brilliant performer. In terms of the people I met, and I'm sorry because I'm giving all sorts of examples of men, and there are actually some brilliant women um, of course, there are brilliant women in the House. As, I mean, I think you know one of the great debaters in the chamber. I mean, Yvette Cooper is extremely accomplished from the front bench. From the back benches, one of the best debaters um, is Stella Creasy. She's a razor sharp and very good. There are some very, very good Tory speakers. Anna Subri was very good. Dominic Grieve was extremely good. Oliver Letwin was just clinical and incisive and and also unfailingly courteous. Um, all of those people were brilliant. But of the sort of global states people, the one I enjoyed meeting most and found most impressive on a human level was actually Barack Obama. Obama gave a great speech to the House in May 2011 when he addressed both Houses of Parliament in Westminster Hall. I met him the night before with my wife at Buckingham Palace, a sort of pre-Westminster Hall, pre-Parliament visit banquet, if you like, and Obama made a big thing of saying, well, I mustn't, Mr. Speaker, I mustn't speak tomorrow for too long. You know, and I, I said, I don't think you should be worried about, I mean, his speech had probably been written by then anyway, but I said, I don't think you should be bothered about that, Mr. President. The House, 
the house is, the House of Commons, the House of Lords want to hear you. You can speak for as long as you like, within reason, you know. But he said, mm, we thought he oughtn't to speak for too long. He was very funny. He started, he made a very serious speech about transatlantic relations and so on, but he started with a very amusing line that I remember to this day. Uh, Mr. Speaker, Prime Minister, my Lord Speaker, etc., etc. He said, I am reliably informed that the three most recent visitors to Westminster Hall before me have been the Queen, the Pope, and Nelson Mandela, which is either a very high bar or the beginning of a very funny joke, <laughs> um, which got him off to a very good start. But actually, it was not even the speech, Julian. The thing that impressed me most about Obama was different. It was a little thing, but I think revealing. Helene Heyman, Baroness Heyman, was the Lord Speaker at the time, and I the common speaker, and we took Barack Obama on a tour of both houses, of both chambers, the Commons Chamber, which is not where he was going to be speaking, but the Commons Chamber and the Lord's Chamber. And in the process, we went through the central lobby. And on duty at the extremities of the central lobby were about half a dozen doorkeepers who perform an important and valued role in the House, as you know, but they're largely unsung heroes. <coughs> and it was not, repeat, not being filmed. This was not being filmed. It was off camera. And unprompted, I probably should have suggested it, or Helene should have done, but neither of us did. Unprompted, Obama went up to each and every one of those doorkeepers to say hello and to shake hands. And I still have the image in my mind now of just how bowled over with gratitude those important but unsung public servants were and to me, that was big, because it wasn't in the public gaze, but it was, I think, a measure of the man. Can you imagine that veritable boil on the backside of humanity, <laughs> Donald Trump, <laughs> taking the remotest interest in any other human presence, <laughs> either in the central lobby, the chambers, or Westminster Hall, than himself? I recalled earlier at a meeting with students that Jess Phillips, my parliamentary colleague Jess Phillips, once said, rather unkindly, but probably correctly, once said to Boris Johnson across the floor of the House, Mr Speaker, I sincerely believe that the Prime Minister wakes up every morning to an image of himself. Well, that may be true of de Feffel, but it is 1,000% true of Trump. What a loathsome specimen of humanity. <laughs> and on that positive note, we'll turn to other questions. So, <laughs> thank you very much, John. <laughs> Is that all right? Okay. Okay. So, so we, we have a team with, 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 with my friends, so please do wait for them, and I'll try to take them as much as I can. And I'll take the, the person over here first. Thank you. It's been great to hear you speak, rather Thank than you. merely chanter from a sedentary position. <laughs> but um, um, I wanted to ask you about our, um, our unwritten constitution. Yes. And, I mean, to me, the, the Brexit um, um, situation was really the, the juxtaposition of um, the very foreign concept of a, um, a referendum mm. and at the same time uh, a parliamentary democracy, which is a representative system, and the two were sort of forced together. Mm. Uh, the, you know, with, with clearly um, diff different uh, opinions. Um, I, I wonder whether that basically um, shows the need for a, a written constitution right. uh, and what your thoughts would be of that. We're, we're gonna, I'm going to try to fit in quickish questions okay, and quickish quick answers, answers, if yep. that's possible. Then. Absolutely. Right. Uh, the short answer is that I think amongst other factors and experiences of recent times, it does help to make the case for a written constitution. I say amongst other factors... I don't want to downplay the significance of that particular juxtaposition that you have just described, because it was, as you say, really a clash of opposites. The plebiscitary method of decision-making versus the parliamentary method of decision-making. Now, I have not always been opposed to referenda, but I do think that fundamentally as a means of resolving quite complex matters, not should we have an increase in the council tax in this area, 
this local government area hypothecated, say, to pay for a particular service. But a massive issue affecting the country, the continent and the world. It is an extremely blunt instrument and almost certainly, how can I put it, surgically inadvisable. I think the parliamentary method is better. It would be better if we had some clear delineation of functions and some sense within our constitution of who does what and what might trigger a referendum. I mean, one thing that's strange about that was that there was no threshold requirement, and I've no recollection that anybody tabled an amendment for a threshold requirement, i.e. I- that there should be a 60% vote in favour of Brexit. So the result was legitimate in, in a legal sense, but it was extraordinary. It was also extraordinary in the sense that the House decided against 16 and 17 year olds voting. Alistair Carmichael for the Liberals tabled an amendment for that. Cameron rejected it, I think, because he probably thought that it would segue into 16 and 17 year olds voting in general elections, which maybe it might have done. Ironically, if 16 and 17 year olds had been able to vote, the result might have gone the other way. But does the dispute and that juxtaposition make the case for a written constitution. I think it does, together with a number of other things that should be clearer about, for example, prorogation. Uh, you know, the, the government absolutely shouldn't have prorogued Parliament in September 2019, and they lost 11 nil in the Supreme Court. That extreme national embarrassment could have been averted if there were greater clarity about where power rests. So the short answer is I do think there should be a written constitution. I don't think there's the slightest prospect of one under a Conservative government. And my sense is that it won't be high on Labour's list. I think Starmer will be focused on economics, public services in a first term. But it's not impossible that in a second term that and House of Lords reform might start to feature. So that takes me nicely to a question uh, online, uh, and I'll come to, to ones in the room, so do put your hands up and I'll keep an eye out for, from uh, Alexandra Cooper. If Labour wins the next election, how do you think Keir Starmer will perform in Parliament as Prime Minister? And what will the biggest challenges be for Labour? Well, in some ways you might think that it would be more difficult to perform as Prime Minister because instead of asking critical questions, you're having to answer for policy. But don't underestimate the extent to which occupying the office and having an army of people around you is a great strength enhancer. You know, it it really does load the dice in favour of the government. So I don't think there will be a huge change I think that uh, if Keir Starmer becomes Prime Minister, which, by the way, I expect, I don't think there are no certainties in our politics, but I think it's more likely than not that he'll either get an overall majority, possibly quite substantial, or that he will get into government because, frankly, he's he's got a wider route to number 10. Rishi Sunak's route back to number 10 is very, very, very narrow, which, I mean, it basically depends on the Democratic Unionists, again, that was a pretty miserable saga for Theresa May, and I don't think that's going to happen. I think that Keir will perform with slightly greater confidence. What are going to be the issues? I think the the biggest challenge he's got is that there's much to do and not much money to do it. it you know, In a sentence, that is the summary of Labour's problem. Now, you don't have to be an absolutely hardcore Blairite, Uh, I don't say that disparagingly (laughs) of Tony Blair, I'm rather an admirer of Tony Blair's, but I don't myself believe that the Labour Party can't ever go an inch to the left of Tony Blair without fear of electoral oblivion. I don't subscribe to that view. I think that the situation in the country has changed, the scale of demands on the public services, public attitudes have shifted and so on and so forth. So, you know, and I think Labour has established some reputation for competence and fiscal discipline, and I think it probably will under Starmer again. So I don't think that it's got no scope, but there isn't a huge amount of money, and COVID hasn't helped in that respect, and expectations will be high. So, I mean, Keir Starmer's not going to ask my advice. He's got plenty of people to advise him. He doesn't need my advice. But my view, for what it's worth, is that in any leadership position, even in my relatively subordinate role as Speaker, you need to have a set of priorities. You can't try to do everything. It's better to have a limited set 
of reasonably ambitious but deliverable goals and stick to them like a limpet and chase progress and have people in charge of them that you trust and have milestones and yardsticks and measurements to see how the uh, advancement is being achieved. But you're not going to be able to do everything. My view, for what it's worth, is that a big issue for the Starmer government is going to be housing. I mean, that's only one example, but housing, in my view, I mean, obviously the state of the health service, state of the education service, transport infrastructure, blah, blah, blah. I think housing is going to be a huge issue. The cost of housing has become stratospheric to the point of misery making, in particular for the young in big cities. In London and the South East, Cambridge, you know about it. I think that's a big issue. And, and we are going to have to have substantial housing development. But I think there are two progressive aspirations that sometimes clash. The aspiration to have more housing, both private and public, on the one hand, and the issue of environmental protection and reducing carbon emissions and protecting you know, the countryside and all the rest of it. And those sometimes clash. For my part, I think housing and needing more of it and decent quality and with some public investment, you know, is about as deserving a progressive cause as progressive causes come. Okay. There's a question at the back there. Hello, thank Hello. you for coming. Thank you. Um, I just had, I wanted to come back to what you said about why you are not in politics anymore and how you accused... Uh, the, independent, the independent body uh, that found that um, your, the accusations of bullying were not unfounded. And you talked to an example about a woman who um, accused you of looking badly at her, which we can disregard, but I want to bring our attention to someone called Angus Sinclair, who uh, the report concluded that he had been verbally abused and berated. And it also, the Guardian reports that you later apologised for this. So don't you think there's an issue in, at least this is what the Guardian article says, uh, don't you think there's an issue in former politicians and you as former Speaker of the House to disregard uh, an, independent, an independent body's decision? And doesn't that you know, point us to a broader strand in politics of um, men in politics disregarding um, accusers of bullying and harassment. OK, thank you. I must admit I didn't see the, the Guardian report to which you refer. I'm not disputing it. I'm not arguing the toss with you. I'm certainly not accusing you of making it up or anything like that at all. I'm just saying I didn't see that. But I do know what I did say and what I didn't. And I was asked whether I wanted to issue a letter of reflection, if you will, and I indicated very clearly in writing, it's a matter of record, that I didn't wish to do so. And I most certainly didn't apologise. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I've apologised for all sorts of things over the years, in my own home, to members of my family, and to all sorts of people when I've made mistakes, and we're all flawed, to err is human, and I'm very happy to do so. What I wasn't prepared to do was to apologise for things that I don't believe be true, things I don't believe I did. And I gave evidence in that matter. The matters concerned spanned from June 2009 to July, June 2010. And the, that person was dismissed from his post and left the house at that time. He did, as he was entitled to do 10 years later, bring a complaint. Uh, did I verbally abuse him? I stand by my evidence that I most certainly did not verbally abuse him. I was alleged to have sworn at him. Uh, there was nobody present on that occasion, but he, 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 not me, he, named his witness. And his witness, he said, was not present, but he told her about it afterwards. And that witness was found and asked, and she said she had no recollection of it at all. And there was no other example of me allegedly swearing at him. Uh, he made an allegation about a telephone, a mobile phone, being thrown. And one of the witnesses, one of the people that he named, was asked, and that person said, no, he had absolutely no recollection, he gave written evidence, absolutely no recollection of any such thing happening. And the argument of the decision-makers was, well, Obviously, these people don't remember it happening, 
but why would the complainant say it happened if it didn't? Ladies and gentlemen, evidentially, I politely suggest to you, in a court of law, <laughs> I mean, a matter like this, which wasn't criminal, wouldn't be heard in a court of law anyway, but what is the point of asking the witnesses? We spent quite a bit of time drawing up witness lists. What's the point of asking witnesses if when witnesses give evidence that a thing didn't happen, the concluding arbiter of the matter says, oh, well, the witness doesn't remember it. <laughs> I mean, it's a case, forgive me, but it's a case of heads he wins, tails I lose. Uh, my thesis is that is an absurd procedure, particularly when you are dealing with something that is a decade or so ago. There are issues, there are issues about men and the gender imbalance in Parliament, which, by the way, I did my best to tackle. It wasn't done by some of the people busily criticising me. The person busily criticising me very strongly objected to me making a decision to recruit the first female and first black speaker's chaplain in the history of the House of Commons. That person working for me tried to stop me doing that. He thought it was improper. Uh, he didn't believe that I'd got it right. He thought I should have observed a a different procedure and so on. I stuck to my guns, ladies and gentlemen, and I appointed the Speaker's chaplain of my choice, and I'm very proud of doing that. So he's entitled to his views. In my opinion, his evidence was wrong, and it may be very convenient to say, oh, I'm very sorry if I caused offence and so on. I'm not going to apologise for what I didn't do, and it's not a question, if I may say so, of disregarding an independent report. I'm not disregarding it. I'm simply saying I think it suffers from the disadvantage of being wrong. And I'm entitled to that opinion. As, as in fairness, the panel is entitled to its opinion. But I'm not going to say I was wrong when I don't believe I was. That's life. So there was a question at the front row here, and I saw one behind it afterwards. Thank you. Hi, thank you very much. Um, uh, I'm asking your opinion here, not sort of uh, veracity. There's a COVID inquiry at the moment. Yeah. Um, and I have first-hand, long, painful experience of inquiries to do with the NHS. Um, we had Messenger, and I was involved in the Outram report. And um, it tends to be the case that we have these inquiries, like Sue Gray, reports are found, they're very scholarly, they're very lengthy, they're marvellous, they've cost a fortune, and nothing happens. What are your views on that, or am I wrong? No, I fear your cynicism is justified. I think it's very unlikely that much will flow from it in terms of sanctions. Because I think what will happen is that there will be a report, and it may well be that it's a very critical report, and all sorts of people will be named. It's not that I think that will be ducked. I don't think so. In a way, the bar's been set reasonably high by Sue Gray, uh, who did make some quite considerable determinations on these matters. So I think that with the COVID inquiry, I don't think it will just burke the issues. I think it will address them and people probably will be heavily criticised. But it's so long after the event by the time it's produced that I can't see very much happening. And a number, not necessarily all, but a number of the people who will be criticised have already left the House and a number more will. So, for example, Boris Johnson's already gone. And let's face it, Boris Johnson, you know, has been eviscerated by it. I mean, it's not stopped him doing all sorts of other things, but, you know, he effectively felt that he had to leave the House, and if he hadn't left the House, there would probably have been a by-election, and he might well have been forced out anyway. But he's gone. Matt Hancock is not going to stand again at the general election anyway. So does that mean it's pointless? No, I don't think it makes it pointless. But I think that it depends whether you think that it should all be about actual sanctions. If it's exclusively about sanctions, then you will be disappointed. But if you think there is a merit in having these processes for the purpose of learning something from them, then I think there is still merit. But, you know, am I expecting that there will be sort of half a dozen by-elections as a result? No. I can't resist a question that's come in online from anonymous attendee. OK. Uh, should Suella Braverman be Home Secretary? No. <laughs> no. Right. <laughs> uh, no. I mean, no. Uh, for, forgive me. Forgive me. I mean, look, you know, we are dealing here in plain sight with observable matters. The, the person at the back there 
very properly and fairly asked me a question, and I gave an answer. It's perfectly obvious from her reaction. I don't think she likes my answer, but that's, you know, it's, it's too bad that I don't like her, <laughs> the thrust of her question. It's too bad that she doesn't like my answer. That's life. You know, you just have to agree to differ. But the point I want to make here about Suella is, is not personal. I've got nothing against Suella personally. She was always perfectly courteous to me. The nub of the matter is this, and I'm sorry if this is brutal, uh, but it's not bullying. It's the, we're in the field of politics. Uh, the simple fact of the matter is that Suella has an ambition which is wholly out of kilter uh, with her ability. <laughs> uh, the, the truth of the matter is she's just not up to it. All the evidence shows that what she's done is she's built a career by playing certain theme tunes that go down well in the sections of the Conservative Party, and she advances as a result of doing that. She's a darling of the Bre some of the Brexiteers, the extreme Brexiteers in the Conservative Party. She's had responsibility since becoming Home Secretary for Immigration and Asylum. It's no good her blaming everybody else. She has failed to formulate a coherent policy. Her approach is sloganising rather than finding solutions. So I don't personally think she should remain in government a moment longer. I think she's very likely breached the ministerial code. Uh, Rishi uh, Sunak I always found extremely courteous. He was probably a very efficient merchant banker. I have no reason to doubt it. He is not a high quality Prime Minister. I mean, he's a considerable improvement upon Liz Truss, but the, the, the bar was set very low. And as far as De Feffel is concerned, he's the most corrupt Prime Minister in history. So obviously, on Johnson and Truss, Rishi's an improvement. The only time I thought Rishi was doing really well, and as somebody who wouldn't have voted Conservative, I admit, but I thought when he did the Windsor framework, if you remember, the revised protocol, there I thought he showed a bit of leadership early on when Johnson was huffing and puffing and threatening to rebel and try to defeat the deal and so on, you know, to his credit, Sunak stood up to him and said, I am trying to improve a deal that wasn't mine. In other words, I didn't make this mess, but I'm going to try to rescue something, salvage something from it and improve the situation. And that was to his credit. I think the right thing to do would be just to dismiss her. And I was asked earlier by students about another matter, and it just caused me to think of a a contrast between Sunak dithering now and what happened, ladies and gentlemen, for those of you with very long memories, which is probably not many people in this audience, but in 1968, when Enoch Powell made an incendiary speech about immigration, which went down very well with racist voters, including a lot of Tory activists. Ted Heath was, was leader of the party at the time, uh, Enoch was, I think, if I remember rightly, Shadow Defence Secretary at the time. Ted Heath didn't go asking the whips to phone round colleagues, what do you think of Enoch's behaviour? Should he be in the government? Should he not? He didn't wait for opinion polls. Ted Heath sacked Enoch Powell with immediate effect, saying he thought that the speech was racialist in tone and indefensible, or words to that effect, and Enoch was dismissed. Now that was leadership. And I would respect Rishi if he just said to Suella, Suella, I'm trying to run a government. I'm the leader of the team. I need people to play as part of the team. You're not doing that. Enjoy your time on the back benches. And quite a lot of people would say, good luck to him. This endless procrastination and dither is utterly demeaning. So I want, we are running out of time. I want to try and Sorry. fit in four questions. Okay. There's one there, one there, and there's two online. So we'll do that one first. Hello, thank you. Um, I was just wondering, you know, where you stand as a Jew on the, on the Gaza-Israeli conflict at the moment? Yeah. Um, short answer, I'm in favour of a two-state solution. It's not looking very likely at the moment. I think what was done to Israel recently was horrific, and I completely understand why Israelis and a lot of Jewish people around the world and a lot of human beings around the world, regardless of ethnicity or religion, thought it was horrendous. Israel is entitled to defend itself, but if you ask me, do I think Israel is entitled to deploy whatever method it likes to try to see off Hamas and associated forces in Gaza without any regard to the humanitarian consequences, I don't think it has that right, 
Uh, I think that it's very clear what the international legal position is, that it should not use indiscriminate force. Proportionality is a legal principle and an important one at that. And is it justified to withhold food, water, medical supplies from innocent men, women and children in Gaza as a kind of punishment or retaliation? No, it isn't. I actually fear the Israelis are falling into a trap. I think they're doing what the Iranians want them to do, which is reacting with bestiality. And I think it's a terrible mistake. And if you ask me, do I personally favour a ceasefire? I do. But the, I do. I favour a ceasefire. And I don't accept that that's some sort of Palestinian mantra or it's a code for supporting the Palestinians. I want Israel within secure borders and I want to see a Palestinian state that is genuinely autonomous, which I should have thought would be configured around the West Bank. Um, Israel is entitled to exist. Israel should not be building facts on the ground as it's been doing for decades by building settlements in the West Bank and then saying this is our territory. That is wrong. And, you know, I think somebody's got to show a bit of leadership. I fear there won't be much leadership in the United States this side of a presidential election. And I fear that as long as Netanyahu is in office, the chance of a peace deal is not very great. The funny thing is, in these matters, people say they're complex. Well, sometimes the history is complex. The outline of a solution in the Middle East, in Israel-Palestine, isn't complex. It's a question of anybody, whether anybody's got the will. Um, so I'll do... So, so one quick question here, then, then over to you. Um, so a, a, a quick one. Who's the best prime minister the country never had? Who's the best prime minister the country never had? Wow. Uh, somebody's just said Rab Butler. Well, Rab Butler was a great man. I'm not sure. Rab Butler was rather deliberative. Whether he would have been sufficiently decisive, I don't know. I am, I'm going to offer a different suggestion. I do admire Ken Clark very much. I think Ken would have been a good prime minister. Actually, the person I think would have been a, a very good prime minister um, is probably the cleverest Labour figure in the post-war period is Dennis Healy. Mm. I think, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I've, I've often heard this most amazing speech that Michael Foote delivered in the No Confidence debate in 1979, which the government lost, the Labour government lost. And it was a wonderful knockabout, witty, hysterically amusing performance by Michael Foote. Michael Foote was a great House of Commons man, but Michael Foote would not have been a good Prime Minister. Mm -hmm. Dennis Healy was a, a bit of a thug, I mean, an intellectual thug at that. I think Dennis Healy would have been a very fine Prime Minister. But he didn't suffer... F I said Robin Cook didn't suffer fools gladly. Rumour has it that Dennis didn't suffer them at all, mm -hmm. and therefore he made quite a lot of enemies. So, take the question over there. Hi, thank you so much for coming to Jesus. My question is that um, the convention is that often former speakers are given positions in the um, House of Lords. Would you like to position in the House of Lords? Or are you preferring your life outside of the Westminster bubble? Well, I'll give you an absolutely honest answer to that. I would have gone if I'd been offered it. I wasn't, so I didn't, and I won't. And I think that ship has sailed. Does it hugely matter to me? To be honest, no. Uh, I would have taken it, partly because there's an element of... It's the convention, and if every other speaker went to the Lords, why shouldn't I, given that I served longer in post than anybody else in the post-war period? I was elected four times, so I must have been doing something right. So, you know, I think there's an element of rough justice there. And partly, I would like to go, not to say I'd gone to the Lords, but because I would have contributed to debates. And I think I would have been able to overcome my natural shyness and reticence and rise to my feet <laughs> and, and say something in debate. But, you know, there were people who were determined to stop me going. And I enjoy life outside. I do a bit of commercial work. I do a lot of public speaking to commercial audiences. I do a bit of commercial work with the sports business. And I have done a bit of academic lecturing. And I spend more time now playing tennis, which I love, and watching football, which I love, and reading books, which I love, and doing my masters, I'm doing a masters by research, which I love. So am I miserable? No, there are far more <laughs> things to be happy about than to be miserable about. I, I wanted to be a change maker, a speaker. I didn't want just to say to my kids, and God willing, one day my grandchildren, I served as the speaker. I wanted to, I, I met quite a number of people in politics who love holding positions 
and who seemed to measure success by what office they held or offices they held. I wanted to be speaker to do things, to try to make a change for the better. And I am proud of, you know, some of the things that I did and I did my best. So I'm not resentful. I'm not bitter. I'm fun fundamentally happy. You know, I've got a, a lovely family, three amazing kids who hopefully will go on to do much better in life than I've done. And I'm having fun. And, you know, I used to play tennis twice a month. And now I'm in the happy position of being able to play four times a week. And, you know, as a sport of some of my principal interests outside family, I feel I'm blessed. There was a comment at any questions recently from somebody saying, how can young people trust politicians? With that slightly in mind, I'd like to take the more positive angle, which is a question from Jacob Lowe uh, online. Hi, Jacob. Um, hi, as a young person who's interested in a career in politics when I'm older, what advice would you give? First advice, to some extent learning from my mistakes, do something else first. I mean, I think first of all, I'd say to Jacob, get educated as well as you possibly can, which doesn't necessarily mean doing a postgraduate qualification, but it might involve doing that. Particularly now, more and more people go to uni. If you haven't decided what you want to do, there's a lot to be said for doing a master's or for training and obtaining a professional qualification or whatever. But I would say to Jacob and to anybody else considering a political career, I'm not saying don't do any politics until your 30s. I'm not saying that. If you're political, by all means, join a political party. You, you can do it another way through an interest group, pressure group or whatever if you want, Amnesty International. But if you one day think of being an MP, you almost certainly need to join a political party because very few independents are elected. Get involved. Get experience of canvassing. Get experience of asking questions at meeting. Get experience of speaking in debates. Go to the union here if you're thinking one day of you know, a political career. By all means, do, do those things. But do something else first, whether it be as a lawyer or a doctor or an accountant or working in the financial services sector or in industry or for a, or a charity, whatever it may be, do something else first. And there are two reasons for that. The first is that it will actually make you a broader person and more likely to be selected as a candidate for a good constituency, I would say, because there is now a bit of a backlash against professional politicians. And secondly, I think it will actually make you a better politician. I tell against myself, Julian, you know, I, I could tell you the things I think I was good at in the House. You know, I didn't find it difficult to speak at short notice or to deal with situations on my feet. You know, I felt that was a strength. I tell against myself that I sat on a bill quite early in my time, the competition bill, it, on the committee of the bill. I think I'd spoken at second reading, but anyway. Speaking on the general principles is quite easy. On the committee, I was on with Andrew Lansley, who became a cabinet minister, Philip Hammond, who became eventually Chancellor of the Exchequer and Foreign Secretary, and Damien Green. And all of them, Andrew had been a kind of generalist civil servant with a grasp of lots of different things, and he was pretty good on the committee. Philip Hammond brought to bear all his knowledge of the commercial world in studying the clauses of the bill. And Philip was much better on the committee than I was. I could do all the knockabout stuff with the other side till the cows come home, but Philip's knowledge of the issues was much advanced on mine. And so was Damien Greens. He'd worked a bit in the private sector as well, although mainly in the media, but he has some private sector experience. So I would say get experience of another field and it will enhance you as a person. It will make you more likely to be selected and it will give you a base of respect on which to build when you get into Parliament. So that, Jacob, is my advice, and you will receive no bill for it. <laughs> Fantastic. And I'm afraid that's all we have time for, but thank you so much for joining us, John. Thank you. <laughs> is that all right? You have to. So, So that's it for this evening, but there's a lot more still to come. So next week, we'll be looking at the Demerara uprising as part of our exploration of the legacy of slavery uh, and Jesus College. 
We then have the historian Sheila Fitzpatrick talking about the Soviet Union, uh, displacement and memories of loss. We have Lisbeth Rousing talking about organic farming pioneers, what went wrong, looking at the afterlives of Caribbean slavery. Uh, and then we have the BBC's Ross Atkins talking about uh, the art of explanation. And that, that's just till the end of November. So I hope we'll see you again in person or online. Have a very good evening. Thank you.